Today, I wanna talk to everybody who has what I call an appetite for known. You wanna be known by somebody, you wanna be known for something. And before you say this isn't for you, the truth is every single one of us, me included, we all wanna be known for something. You wanna be friended, followed, liked, or mentioned. In fact, you can't get enough friends, enough followers, enough likes, or enough mentions. In fact, somebody watching today, in fact, you're at home on your computer and you're gonna take a picture of this and you're gonna do a selfie of yourself with this screen and see how many mentions you can get, right? Okay, now, if you can't, if you can't relate to any of this, there's another column for the, all the grown-ups in the room, okay? We wanna be recognized, we wanna be admired, we wanna be sought after, and we don't admit this, but we wanna be envied. That's why you bought that car, right? That's why you keep it so clean. That's why right before your husband walks out, you say, uh, honey, come here. That, that still doesn't match, okay? It didn't match last time. It still doesn't match. And I don't really, you know, say this, ladies. I don't care if you look like an idiot, but if we're going out together, I don't want you to look like an idiot because you reflect poorly on me and I want people to envy me, not pity me, okay? <laughs> But there's something in all of us, we want people at some level to envy us. And oftentimes we kind of bank shot our self-esteem off the way the people around us look and the way they behave. And so before long, our desire to be known, especially when we identify what we wanna be known for, it gets us in trouble. Again, it's, a, it's that subtle you know, reflection of pride that begins to shut God and especially others out. The truth is there is a little Lady Gaga in all of us. <laughs> We all live for the applause, applause, applause. And this started when we were children. This started with this statement. Daddy, watch, daddy, watch, daddy, watch. Mama, watch this, mama, watch this, mama, watch this. And if you have kids, you've heard this a thousand times and they want you to watch the same thing over and over and over. What is it? It is this thing in all of us that wants to be known and wants to be approved by people. And then as we grow up, it's a t coach, it's a teacher. It's a set of friends, it's a set of friends, it's a set of friends, it's a set, then it's that boy, and it's that girl. And now we're adults and we have a different audience. We live for the applause of somebody. And it's natural, it's normal. I think in some ways it's a reflection of the image of God. We'll talk about that in a few minutes, but it can get you in trouble. And here's why, because it's an appetite. It's an appetite for known. And this, and this is true of all appetites. If you feed it, it grows. It is never fully and finally satisfied. That's the nature of an appetite. It's never fully and finally satisfied. This is why the more friends, the more friends, fans, and followers you have, the more friends, fans, and followers you, that's right. You'll never have too many followers. You'll never have too many fans. You'll, you'll never say, well, I don't wanna be recognized for what I've done. No one ever says, well, I don't like to see my name in print. I don't see, like to see my name up in lights. I don't like to be recognized for my hard work. I don't want my, my kids to appreciate me. I, I, I don't feel like anybody needs to thank me. No, it, it's in you to be recognized. It's in you to be known. But here's kind of the, the, the tension that's gonna take us to the text today. There is no amount of known that will satisfy your appetite to be known for the thing you have determined you want to be known for. There is no amount of known. It is a bottomless pit. It is an appetite. It is never fully and finally satisfied. Whatever you want to be known for at work, whatever you want to be known for at home, whatever you want to be known for as a parent, whatever you want to be known for in culture, whatever you want to be known for in school, there is no amount of known to fill up your known bucket once and for all, which means because it's an appetite, we are constantly on a quest for more recognition, not in every area, but in the one or two areas that we've decided are important to us. So what we're about to learn isn't about how to not be known. I'm not trying to undermine your known. What we're about to learn from John the Baptist is how to handle it, how to manage it, how to keep it within a context where it actually serves us well and doesn't take over our lives. So here's the story of John the Baptist, and then I'll make this point and tell you a story. Here's how it begins. And this is the, several of the gospel writers um, give us bits and pieces of this story. So I'm going to jump around a little bit, Mark, and also the gospel of John. And so John the Baptist appeared in the wilderness, and, and Mark makes it sort of, a, sort of mysterious, like out of nowhere, here, here he comes. Appeared in the wilderness, preaching a baptism of repentance. So he's preaching about baptism. He's baptizing. And by the way, John the Baptist is the first person we know in history that actually baptized another person. Before this, every people had a 
there was a ceremony that Jews did where they did a, a ceremonial cleansing and they would baptize themselves. They would dip themselves down, you know, representing dying to one thing and coming alive to another. Um, this is what um, non-Jews did as part of becoming Jewish or embracing Judaism. But no one that we know in history ever baptized another person. So this is like, whoa, what is he doing? This is a big deal. A baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sin. And then this next statement is huge. The whole Judean countryside and all the people of Jerusalem went out to him. Now, if you're reading the Bible alone in isolation, you would read right by that and just go on to whatever's next, but this is a big deal. Even if this is literary hyperbole, you know how you say sometimes, well, everybody was there. Well, like, you know, there were thousands of people there and it's kind of hyperbole to make a point. A lot of people were there. Even if this is hyperbole, this means there were thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of people who went out to see John the Baptist. And if the whole, if everybody from Jerusalem went to see him, that is an, you gotta get up before the sun rises, you get there as the sun sets, you spend a day listening and watching John, then you spend another day walking uphill all the way back to the city of Jerusalem. So this was not a casual endeavor. This is a three day trip to, see, to hear John the Baptist. And the gospel writers tell us that everybody in Jerusalem went. Everybody in the whole Judean countryside went to hear John. Thousands and thousands, so much so that people thought this must be the Messiah. I mean, we've not had this much energy and this excitement in our lifetime, okay? So this is a big crowd. He is very, very well known. John testified concerning him, talking about Jesus. He cried out saying, this is the one I spoke about. And you think my sermons are confusing, check this out. This is the one I spoke about when I said, he who comes after me has surpassed me because he was before me. <laughs> Do what? Yeah, let me say it again. He who was after me has surpassed me because he was before me. It's like, it's a, it doesn't make any sense, but there are a lot of people here. It must be important, right? So what he, he's talking about Jesus, this is awesome. He says, look, the one who's coming after me, you haven't seen him yet, is greater than me because he actually existed before me as he talks about Jesus. Now he continues. Now this was the testimony. Uh, this was John's testimony when the Jewish leaders in Jerusalem sent priests and Levites to ask him who he was. He did not fail to confess, but confessed freely. So these people came from Jerusalem to say, what's this all about? Who are you? And they wanna know, they really wanna know, even though they don't wanna ask him, it's like, are you the Messiah? I mean, we've been waiting a long time and this is, there's, a lot, there's a lot of energy. People are thinking a revolution's about to break out. Are you the Messiah? And so he says, he says it before they even ask. I'll tell you what, who I'm not, I'm not the Messiah. And they ask him, well, then who are you? Are you Elijah? Because the last book in the Old Testament, the book of Malachi said that when the son of man or when, the, when God does something new in the nation of Israel, a prophet will rise up that will be kind of like the Old Testament prophet Elisha. And so we, some people thought he would be reincarnated, that Elisha would come back from the dead, or maybe there'd just be another prophet that was like Elisha. So they're like, okay, are you the guy that, you know, Malachi was talking about? And he said, I am not. I'm not the prophet. He answered, they said, are you the, are the prophet? He said, no. And finally they said, well then, who are you? What do you say about yourself? You're not the Messiah. You're not Elijah. I mean, you got a big, big crowd. Who are you? Now, this is his big moment, right? This is when he gets to say, I am John. The, you know, this is, this is your moment. You know, you got, all eyes are on you. Who are you? And his answer is fabulous. He says this, John replied, and he actually hijacked some words from the book of, from the prophet Isaiah. John replies in the words of Isaiah the prophet, I am a voice, oh, I'm the voice of one calling in the wilderness. Make straight the way for the Lord. Who are you, John? I'm a, I'm a sign, I'm a road sign, I'm a directional marker. I have attracted people to me so that I can point in the direction of him. I have got all this knownness so that I can make him known. I am simply to draw a crowd so that I can point the crowd in the direction of the one who was before me, who comes after me, who has surpassed me. Now, goes on. Now the Pharisees who had been sent questioned him, why then do you baptize if you're not the Messiah, nor Elijah, nor the prophet? And he says, well, if you think this is something, I'd baptize with water, John replied, but among you stands one who you do not know. He is the one, he is the one who comes after me, the straps of whose sandals I am not worthy to untie, meaning I'm not even worthy to be his servant. You see this big crowd I've drawn, people walking from all over the place, spend the night camping out to hear me speak, you think I'm something, you wait till the real deal gets here, I'm the warm up band, wait till the main act steps out on the stage, it's gonna be fantastic. 
the text goes on. The next day, right after this encounter with the, the guys from Jerusalem, the next day John saw Jesus coming toward him, and he said, look, look, look. At least that's what he was here for. Everybody's looking at John. John says, can I have your undivided attention? Look, the Lamb of God, this is a famous line, isn't it? The Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. The reason I am so well known is to make that guy right over there known. Then the next day, something else happens. The next day, John was there again, same place with two of his disciples, because just like Jesus, John had a, a group of followers that you know, were his disciples, kind of his guys. You know, He was there with two of his disciples when he saw Jesus passing by, and once again, because this is his job, he said to his guys, his closest followers, look, look, and they looked. The Lamb of God. But this time, something interesting happened. Look at this. When the two disciples heard him say this, they followed Jesus, which meant they unfollowed John. You ever been unfollowed by anybody? It's like, what, what did I do wrong? Hey, I got a problem here, okay. I'm not liked or followed, what's going on here? So they, they say, John, thank you so much for making us famous and thank you so much for taking care of us. But if that's the guy you've been waiting on, you know, the one that was before you, that came after you, that surpassed you, we never figured that out. But if that's the guy that you've been pointing at, then see ya, don't wanna be ya. And they left John the Baptist to follow Jesus. Wow. I mean, that's disturbing if you're John the Baptist, you're starting to lose your, your posse starting to lose the core group. Uh-oh. Well, this, this didn't bother John, as we're about to discover, but it really bothered his closest followers. So they came running up to John to try to you know, make sure he's okay. And are you okay, buddy? And it's okay. We'll get you some more followers. So here's what the text tells us. It says, they came to John and they said to him, Rabbi, so that's a title of respect, Rabbi. You know, you're the teacher, you're the guy. Rabbi, that man, talking about Jesus. That man, that man who was on the other side of the Jordan with you, you know, the one you testified about, look, he is baptizing. Now, John, this is not good because you invented baptism, okay? Like you are John the Baptist, he is Jesus the, we don't even know what he is, he doesn't even have a title. You are John the Baptist and look, John, he is over there baptizing. We need to up your game. We need to do something. We need to learn to do like a, a double or maybe we have like a portable baptistry and we move it closer to the city of Jerusalem so people don't have to walk so far. Look, he's baptizing and look at this statement. And everyone is going to him. To this, John replied. Now, if you haven't been paying attention, I need you to come on back and pay attention because this next statement is the reason we're here today. This next statement is what would allow you to have an infinite number of followers and fans and friends and it never go to your head. Better, this next statement prepares you or has the potential to prepare all of us for that day when we have fewer friends, fewer fans, fewer followers, when the new kid on the block arrives, the prettier one, the smarter one, the more talented one, the one that makes your sales figures look like you're a, you're a beginner, you're a novice, you just got out of graduate school. This is, this is the idea that prepares us for the day when we're not the person, we're not the star, we're not on the stage. Suddenly, we, our better days are behind us. This is what ke will keep us from grasping and clinging to and trying to hold on to something that begins to slip through our hands. You ready? This is, this is unbelievable. So they're like, John, John, you're losing it. You're losing it. You're losing the crowd. We got to come up with something. We got to prop you back up. We got to get you some more people. And John replied, I love this. A person can receive only what is given them from heaven. To which I think John's followers were like, Okay, did you hear what we said? What does that have to do with anything? That's kind of like you came before you and came after you and surpassed you. Think, okay, what? Okay, John, you're, you're losing followers. You're not as popular. You know, you don't have as many mentions. And John's going, I, I know. Let me just say it again. A person can receive only what is given them from heaven. Now, this is amazing. Here, here's what John's saying. He's saying, guys, wait, 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 look. All this knownness I have, all this fame and fortune and drawing a crowd, look, where do you think that came from? Well, John, you're like, no, 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 John, no, no. See, everything good comes from my heavenly father. Everything that's been placed in these hands comes from God, which means when God places it in there, I give credit to God. And when God decides to take it away, I give credit to God and I do not freak out. You're bothered by the fact that I'm losing fans and friends and followers. I am not. 
Because ultimately everything that is placed in my hands, all my knownness is temporary. All my knownness is a stewardship. All my knownness is a gift. And I will not make the mistake of thinking for a moment that it is about me. Wow. He goes on, he says, you yourselves, talking to, to the group that have been with him the whole time, you yourselves can testify that I said, I am not the Messiah, but sent ahead of him. I mean, I've been telling you the whole time that my knownness is about his knownness, that I'm actually here to make him known. So if he becomes more known than me, why should that bother me? In fact, John says this, this, this big statement, maybe you've heard before. He says, guys, come on. He must become greater and I must become less. Now, I know that bothers you. He says, but it doesn't bother me. My desire is to be, my desire to be known doesn't own me. I'm not owned by my desire to be known. In fact, I'm only known to make him known. And if you're a Christian, do you know what this means for you, what it means for me? That our known is a means of making him known, period. That you're known for whatever you're known for, for however long you're known for it, by whomever you're known, is a means to an end of making him known. It is not about you, it's never been about you. And if you wanna get weird quick, if you wanna be strange quick, if you wanna just hand pride the remote control forever, just try to hang on to what you never had control of to begin with. Because the reason we're known is to make our savior, no, it's not just a cliche. John said, hey, this is how I'm gonna survive, being at the pinnacle of success to the point where nobody even knows I was here. So here's kind of the bottom line, and I'll tell you a story. To be a known survivor, that is to survive your appetite for known, it's remember who it's from and who it's for. You just gotta remember every single day who it's from, who placed my knownness in my hand, who's allowed me to, given me this gift, who's given me this opportunity, who brought along this opportunity, who allowed me to be born in this country, in this city at this particular time, who made it so that I was able to meet these people and have these opportunities, who gave me the ability to sing, the ability to speak, the ability to sell, the ability to relate, who made me so beautiful, who made me so attractive, who gave me my personality. I mean, you have no control over any of that. You remember who it's from, and if you're a Christian especially, you remember who it's for. And then God can place an, an, an amazing amount of knownness in your hands and it won't hurt you. It will simply reflect well on him. And when it begins to dissipate and slip through your fingers, you won't grasp. You'll say with John the Baptist, hey, everything ultimately comes from heaven. Our known, another way of saying it, is for his re now, 